Dr. Stephen Crocker, board chair of ICANN from 2011 to 2017. Steve, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Let's get right to it. ICANN's relationship with the U.S. government is very long, very complex. What would you deem as its most problematic points in its history? Problematic points, yes, indeed. Um, uh, different, uh, different people have different perspectives. I'll tell you mine. Um, we operated until last fall uh, under an IANA contract. Now, there were actually two. Fall of 2016. 2016, yes, thank you. And, and uh, as we know, there were really two uh, parallel relationships. There was the IANA contract, and then there was another relationship which was first started as a memorandum of understanding and then transformed into a joint project agreement and then transformed yet again into affirmation of commitments. Um, and now the affirmation of commitments have been swallowed up into our uh, new bylaws. Um, that sequence was aimed at uh, general properties of ICANN, of uh, accountability and uh, general oversight. Uh, I found the IANA contract, however, which was a um, a more cut and dried, uh, ordinary contract of, you know, we are hiring ICANN to do the following things, and here's the list, and you um, execute that, and we evaluate you, and if we don't like what you're doing, we'll uh, tell you about it, and if we really don't like what you're doing, we may move it, and so forth. Um, I found all that to be uh, much more problematic, and for reasons different from what most other people found. Uh, the IANA contract uh, served as an irritant to, uh, on the international stage uh, because it made very clear that the U.S. controlled the IANA function and uh, that was somewhere between uncomfortable and threatening to, depending upon uh, which countries we're talking about. Uh, I had the privilege uh, of seeing all of it from the inside and seeing how it all operated and I found it uncomfortable for um, uh, sort of lesser or more subtle reasons in that it uh, uh, there were aspects where we couldn't be forthright about some of the details. We couldn't publish all our procedures. We couldn't be um, forthcoming about how long it took various things to happen and so forth. And those are very, very small points which you can work with, and as we did over time, but it's corrosive. It, 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 it unbalances the relationship, and it put us, uh, I can, in a very awkward position of uh, not being able to be as forthright and as transparent as we would like to have been, as we should have been. So, for an organization that utters the words accountability and transparency every third sentence, it seems like it would be incredibly problematic. It, it was, for exactly that reason, it was incredibly problematic. And, and so just, to, just to emphasize it, it was uh, philosophically, as you're suggesting, it was completely contrary. And so, you know, this sort of deep irony uh, that, that we had to operate under that despite what we were saying. And then even if that had not been um, as big an issue, uh, just any organization that's operating like that, it's, it's very unbalanced. People who are in the position of providing that service and interacting with the government find themselves uh, uh, having two masters. They have the internal management structure and then they have the external uh, government uh, oversight. And um, sometimes those are at odds with each other. Why was that in the contract? Why were these non-disclosure factors built into the contract? I don't know. Um, uh, I had, in my earlier life, when I worked at DARPA, um, been in the same position of overseeing contracts, and we took a completely opposite position. Um, only if there was a very specific reason having to do with classified information, basically, would we uh, put controls on our contractors. Mainly we wanted them to uh, be as open and as forthcoming as possible. We put very few uh, restrictions on. Um, uh, so I don't want to speak for them. I, I, I can only speak for what I saw as the results, the effects, and that, I've, that I found um, uh, inappropriate and uh, uh, hobbling in a way. And uh, I am just absolutely delighted that we have gotten past that point. An interesting question is whether there will be some different set of things that uh, get in the way, but hopefully not. When I interviewed your good friend, Vince Sir, yep. and asked him to characterize the U.S. government relationship with ICANN, he said 
not very supportive and problematic. Is that an overstatement? Uh, it's not an overstatement, and I know why he said that. Uh, he was focused on yet a different aspect, which was uh, there are there were there are there were and there continue to be um, some very specific intellectual property questions and uh, sort of legalistic questions that uh, at the time he was looking for um, strong help in um, um, disposing of certain issues and uh, uh, the government was not willing to do that. Um, and so those issues have to be fought out separately. Uh, I, I don't want to get into it because I have not spent the same amount of time as, as he did, but our domain names property are, uh, is, is that kind of catch, catchphrase question that comes up. And uh, um, uh, you have uh, people suing for damages against a country and winning a lawsuit against the country and saying, and their top level domain ought to be something that I can have and take away from the country. And we say, oh my God, that's uh, very problematic. You mentioned the, the stewardship transition, so let's deal with that for just a second. Yeah. Strickling announces that March 14th, yes. 2014. How much back and forth had there been between ICANN in NTIA or other branches of the U.S. government, for that matter, prior to that announcement? Quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, I could joke and say, oh, it just came out of the blue, but that's obviously not the case. Um, the, it, it, there's the long and the shorter view of it. It had been a open question for a very long time. When ICANN was formed in 1998, late 98, it was expected uh, that that contract would expire within a couple of years. The year 2000 was kind of mentioned as the thing. Well, here we are more than a decade later and it's still going on and on and on. And there have been a lot of attempts to revisit it, to understand why and, and, and so forth. Um, a number of things came together in the few years just prior to that date. Fadi Shahadi was hired as the CEO um, uh, I had been chair for about a year uh, when we brought him on board and um, uh, so this was very much on my mind and he was the kind of person that is a change agent and um, went about uh, trying to position ICANN so that its status was appropriate for, for believability, for credibility, for being counselors. And then there were external events. There was um, uh, Wicket, uh, WCIT. In 2012, there was uh, the Snowden revelations. Um, different people will give you uh, different estimates as to which of those and maybe other events were uh, sufficient to trigger willingness within the U.S. government to think that it's now time to distance ourselves from this relationship because uh, the U.S. government was being um, uh, uh, treated as, uh, talked about as if they were exercising a great deal more control than they were. And so this was, uh, um, you know, like a millstone around their neck. So, Steve, if you hadn't had those things, if you hadn't had Fadi Shahadi yeah. as CEO, you hadn't had Strickling, Strickling as, yes. as NTIA, and you hadn't have had the Snowden disclosures as a backdrop, would it have happened? So that's an unknowable question. Uh, 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 well, what do you think? I don't think it was a given that it would happen under all circumstances. Um, so, uh, and in fact, you know, d taking that question and moving forward in time, even after it was announced in f March 14th in 2014 and when the community went through an enormous amount of work, right up to the very last minute, it wasn't 100% certain that it was going to happen. Um, Did you think between the, uh, and I, I posed this question to, yeah. to several others that we've talked to, did you think between that, that March 2014 announcement and when the contract w ended in October 2016, did you ever think this puppy is not going to fly? I was always quite optimistic, frankly. Uh, I recognized where the pessimism, where the concerns came from, and I could see that there were the possibility that it wouldn't happen. And um, 
when you're in a position like that, you obviously have to take the next step and say, oh, what are you going to do if it doesn't go? So you start to think about plan B or you start to think about alternatives. Um, and we did a, a certain amount of that, and I certainly did some mental preparations. Um, I did not want to wind, wake up the next morning and be destroyed. And you know, so I kind of knew what I was going to say if, I, if that was the way things played out and where we were going to try to steer things after that. But I didn't genuinely believe that that was going to happen. I, I always believed that this was going to fly. Uh, later, I came to understand exactly how close it was. What does that mean? Well, there was some um, um, last-minute struggling within the U.S. government uh, and Congress um, about whether Congress was going to force NTIA to continue the contract. It was sort of a backward situation. It, it wasn't NTI had the authority to let the contract expire. Congress would have had to take explicit action to direct them to extend the contract, which they could have done. Um, and uh, this was tied to the budget, which was uh, not passed, and so there's a continuing resolution. This is all inside baseball for um, the U.S. budget process, which is as bizarre as anything. And uh, there was last-minute haggling about whether to put a rider on there, and the, uh, some Republicans wanted to put it on. And uh, they didn't. And uh, then there was yet some more skirmishing afterwards that didn't matter very much. We learned later how close it was that it didn't get put on there. We, we, let's talk about the legislative branch, yeah. the Hill, for yeah. just a couple of minutes since you brought it up. That last hearing, uh, which Senator Cruz chaired before the transition yep. was approved, where he laid in pretty heavily to both Strickling and to our CEO, Yorin Marby. Yep. Did that send alarm bells ringing for you? No, we just sent flowers afterwards uh, because <laughs> they, they were subjected to uh, <laughs> serious uh, abuse. <laughs> Steve, uh, the community decided to launch into accountability yes. as an element of the transition, which was not originally proposed by Strickling. Correct. Was that problematic? Well, it was problematic in a couple of different ways. Uh, uh, one of the big and most obvious things is that it caused a whole year's extension in the process. It caused uh, a lot of people to be involved in discussions that were somewhat distant from the original question about are we an up and running organization, are we doing our job, uh, are we structured right to carry out the IANA function? And so it was uh, sort of layered on multiple uh, other issues. And as part of that, it also triggered uh, political discussions about is the U.S. giving away the Internet and so forth, which is not really relevant because they didn't have the Internet anymore. Well, but let's deal with that point for just one second, if we could. Uh, it appeared to me that throughout many of the hearings um, on the Hill, not just toward the final days dealing with the transition, yep. the Hill never really got ICANN, didn't really understand ICANN. Is that incorrect? I think that's right, and I think it's right in varying degrees depending upon whom we're talking about, of course. Some, some you know, did well really understand it. Uh, it's also uh, not a whole lot of mystery because... Uh, ICANN is a funny, peculiar, um, odd duck in the in the spectrum. Uh, uh, it is serving a global purpose, uh, serving the entire world, um, and yet it is a non-governmental organization. It's just a, you know, just a California nonprofit corporation. So that discrepancy uh, uh, challenges a lot of preconceptions. Uh, we're a multi-stakeholder operation, and so people say, yeah, but government should be in charge. And the answer is no, government should be participating, they should be involved. Government people typically have a hard time understanding things like that. Um, so the model of what ICANN is, is not a standard, you know, oh yeah, we've seen many of these and we know what they look like. Um, so, so that's, uh, uh, doesn't be, it doesn't create a lot of surprise that that, uh, congressmen and uh, senators would not have an instantaneous recognition of what we're talking about. How much did the affirmation of commitments, the AOC, set up the transition ultimately? That's a very good question. I simply don't know the answer. Um, what the affirmation of commitments clearly did is it got rid of that 
other layer of formal relationship. And uh, that, was a, uh, that was a big step forward. It was a clever, uh, insightful move. Uh, Paul Toomey and, uh, and Paul Evans set that up and, and Rod Beckstrom sort of s s signed the deal after that. Um, and it, uh, it set in motion a useful set of reviews, a um, little bit heavyweight in some respects, but we, we, that's fine, we can deal with that. Throughout your tenure, not only as chair, but your total right. involvement with ICANN, forgetting the transition for a moment, sure. what was the most problematic or troublesome interaction with the U.S. government that ICANN sustained? Um, I got involved with ICANN uh, through the Security Stability Advisory Committee. Uh, my good friend Vint, whom you mentioned, was chair of the board, and they, uh, this uh, Security Stability Advisory Committee was created in um, um, 2000, late 2001, early 2002, as one of the, as a response to the 9-11 uh, aspects. Um, and uh, Vint uh, said, uh, asked me to come in and chair it for a little while. And uh, so I knew what a little while meant, and I'm still here. Um, and so th that was my entree into the organization, and that was my focus for a good period of time. And I got more involved with uh, the uh, board level stuff, and for a while I was doing both things and then gradually moved over. But anyway, I, that, that's my background, and that's uh, where my focus was. So the kind of things that I found troublesome were the way uh, things relevant in that area got handled compared to the way they should have been handled, at least by, by my light. So, for example, uh, uh, the critical function that ICANN uh, carries out is publication of the uh, parameters for the top-level domain in what's called the root zone and the related who is information. Um, the ethic for that is it's got to be absolutely perfect, absolutely perfect, and uh, uh, because that is depended upon by everybody around the world. And if there's any hiccup in that, that ought to get first-class attention. Not just, you know, like we'll take care of it, but that ought to be a fire, you know, like the alarm going off. So as it happened, a small but nonetheless distinct error happened um, more than a decade ago. And I watched closely to see what the reaction was. And what I expected to happen were two things. I expected that the specific problem would get fixed quickly, and it was. And then I expected that there would be uh, a focused effort on understanding what went wrong, how that came to be, uh, what we call a root cause analysis, and a fix of all that. So the fire alarm went off, but, but the, 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 the cause of the fire was never addressed. Yeah, not very well. I mean, they sort of they looked at it. In, in my view, uh, uh, they did more of a cover-up and a, a patch and so forth. And sure enough, about a year later, uh, a second event, very similar, for, for essentially the same reasons, happened again. And that caused uh, a bigger reaction, but nonetheless uh, still done under, uh, under wraps, uh, no documentation, no insight, uh, no review, uh, and you, that's just not the way you run a first-class system that is a, a critical system that people are going to depend upon. you got, you got to have it. Why uh, wasn't there a fuller review? Why wasn't there greater depth? Well, now we this? go right back to uh, you know, whether I want to uh, say why other people chose to do what they did or what their attitude was, and I, I don't know. Uh, but I'm sure you must have raised questions. Oh, I've raised it more than once, yeah, along the well, way. what came oh, back oh, at you? Basically just sloughing it off, I'd just say, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I think, this goes back to the point that I made at the beginning, which is I think the uh, approach to dealing with uh, ICANN was uh, to keep things um, hidden from view uh, from a government point of view so that there just wasn't a lot of questions asked. And... Um, um, you know, I think we're fortunate that nothing enormously terrible happened. But uh, as I said, it's not the way that um, I was brought up and not the way I would expect that to, to run. As you're well aware, there was a lot of talk uh, around when the transition was being debated. Yep. There was a lot of talk about ICANN's maturation. It was more mature now, so yep. it was time to let it go. In point of fact, could it have, could the transition have occurred much earlier? Oh, yeah. Um, 
Uh, one of the markers, uh, very straightforward, very, you know, no, no uh, big surprise, is, is the organization financially healthy? So in the very early days, uh, peculiarly, it was organized with no funding model. And so the first year or two years were a little bit um, difficult, um, sort of raising money by contributions and so forth. But after a while, uh, there was a funding model, there was money coming in, and uh, we went from you know, several million to 10, 20 million a year, and uh, that felt pretty good. You can run an organization of that size. Um, now we're up to much bigger numbers, but uh, um, I can't imagine any reason we couldn't have uh, been on our own um, five, ten years earlier. Was it a matter, is the reason that, that we weren't on our own earlier, does it have to do as much with politics as the administrations going from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration to the Obama administration? How much variance was there in our interactions with each of those administrations? Um, so I'm pausing because there certainly were big changes there. And at the same time, uh, when you interact with the U.S. government, it's one thing to be interacting at the White House level, right. another thing to be interacting at the cabinet level, another thing to be interacting at the sub-cabinet level. And, and things change rather. And, and at the newspapers, you don't see below the cabinet level if you see that. Um, so I don't know exactly. Um, certainly a lot of things had to be lined up. Ira Magaziner was uh, uh, very important in the structuring of ICANN. He goes away. Is there... Uh, the same kind of focus and insight uh, later in years, and not so much. Uh, and, and the intention level, I mean, I can wasn't a top level priority um, in the same way that it had been in its formation. Since you brought him up, how do you view Magaziner and his concept? I, uh, your your buddy Vince Cerf is often referred to as the father of the internet. Is it fair to characterize Magaziner as the father of ICANN? Uh, probably that's fair, actually. I, I, nobody's ever suggested that, and uh, I don't know how he would feel about it. And there was certainly... As we a, talked to him. He felt pretty good about it. He, uh, I see. Um, but in fairness, and, and, and Vint, yes, does get uh, called the father of the Internet, or uh, sometimes, more appropriately, a co-father or one of the fathers, along with Bob Kahn. But um, uh, for the Internet, for ICANN, for all these things, there's a lot of people involved. And there's a lot of people, there's maybe several people, if not a lot of people, who play very, very key uh, roles and who don't ever get much mentioned by the, uh, there. So, um, uh, Magaziner undoubtedly played. I wasn't, I wasn't directly involved. I wasn't involved at all, actually, during that particular period of time. Magaziner obviously played a, a pivotal role in getting things going. Um, but... Uh, uh, I don't think it's due just to him alone. Based on the things that you have brought up that, that stuck in your mind, yep. it sounds like for the most part there was pretty broad buy-in to the idea, to the concept that the management of the DNS should be privatized. Yep. I, that was true uh, from the very beginning. I, I, you realize that um, as the Internet grew up, the, the DNS was a, a piece of this, and it was done privately you know, within a university, within a research group that was doing research on other internet stuff and it was a clerical uh, detail that grew and grew and grew. So eventually it became problematic to have it have such a weighty operation being operated uh, as an appendage as a, out of a back pocket, if you will, of one of the researchers, John Postel, in a university and uh, he was working at the University of Southern California and um, uh, lawsuits were being threatened, and the uh, university said, what? What, 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 we don't want to be in this business. Um, and so uh, there was a, a, a multi-year period, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I think it was you know, probably from 94 onward, if you know, roughly, where discussions were taking place about how, what's this evolution going to look like. And um, by the time ICANN was formed, uh, there had been several steps leading up to that. You know, in the course of researching this project, something yeah. occurred to me. The Internet evolved in a post-Watergate era. 
yep. you guys were part of the 60s and 70s, yep. the sort of anti-authority, anti-government yep. era. I'm, I'm generalizing, obviously. But I've wondered after talking with a lot of you early pioneers in the internet, how much of that influenced what we have today? Even to a point where you may not have been recognized, may not have recognized that you were choosing a course that was popular at the time. Um, I was actually working, uh, uh, I was a government employee working for DARPA from mid-71 to mid-74. So I'm sitting in Washington um, and we're uh, right in the middle of uh, a lot of very advanced research and, and we're building the ARPANET and then the internet. Um, and meanwhile, Watergate's taking place right outside. I mean, I can look out the window, I can see the Capitol. Uh, uh, I went to hearings and uh, watched Sam Irvin grill John Dean. Um, uh, and I knew what our work ethic was. I knew what our uh, you know, morals were about the way we handled things. We handled government money. We had a fair amount of authority, and, and uh, we were very careful about uh, uh, what we did. And meanwhile, we just look out the window and we see this total chaos and a completely different mindset of uh, uh, how top-level officials were behaving. Uh, so we, we saw actually both sides of it. And we saw, the good, what we, at least I just speak for myself, the good side of government acting uh, in a very upright way to uh, foster the creation of the technology and the distribution of this technology and make it uh, widely available and to keep the government out of people's business and to keep us out of um, having too heavy a hand. And then we, you know, at the same time, all of this is going on outside. And the Vietnam War was, un, un, you know, underway. Um, so uh, it was a, uh, a, a lot of disparate factors were going on all the time. But you guys were not, I mean, John Postel wasn't exactly a, a suit and tie kind of chap. Not exactly. Uh, no, uh, as uh, John was, uh, so John and Vint and I were, among others, three of the graduate students at the first node uh, on the ARPANET at UCLA, and uh, we all worked, you know, relatively closely together. Uh, uh, John was famous for having um, long hair, long beard, and for dressing like a hippie, t-shirt, blue jeans, and um, barefoot or, or very lightweight. I had an experience uh, where um, uh, I was working at DARPA and uh, giving some advice to an Air Force site in Oklahoma uh, about how to connect their machines to the ARPANET to run a, a technical test. And um, uh, after a couple of visits, I said, I got to get John down here. So I, t I called up John. I said, you know, meet me, Oklahoma City. And the question that I had in my mind, which I didn't tell anybody at the time, was for what reason was John going to be refused entrance to the officers club for lunch. Um, was he in fact? And, uh, and I knew that in order to get on an airplane he'd have to have shoes. So we get past that point. And this, is, this is real. I mean, you know, this is, this is uh, 1971 and uh, we're in our 20s and, you know, we're, we're, um, he, he did not get into the officers club. And it turned out to be for blue jeans. Um, but we got into the non-commission of the Officers Club and the food was just as good as in the Officers Club, so it all worked out. Ira Magaziner told us a similar story about trying to get Postel into some government buildings, oh boy. wearing a long robe and the beard and the whole uh, thing. See. He said it was in fact problematic. <laughs> really? Um, just, just another little, I had long hair and a beard too actually in those days. Uh, you wouldn't know it to look at me now. Um, and I reported to work at DARPA, you know, as a program manager with serious responsibility, wearing a suit and tie every day, but with long hair and a beard. And I was not philosophically committed to it. I was fully prepared to, um, you know, cut it all off. And what I discovered was uh, an exact reversal, that people took one look at me and my credibility went up. He can't be here for his looks. He must know what he's talking about. But all of this kind of filters into the question that I was asking yeah. you. And that is, you're concerned about authority. Everybody was concerned yeah. about authority yeah. at that time. I'm just wondering if that concern about authority, and you, you constantly and accurately refer to the government relationship yeah. with ICANN as being a light touch. I'm wondering what, what that time, what that generational influence did in terms of leading to what we had. Yeah, the, um, 
it's an interesting uh, juxtaposition because there was another thing that had the same shape to it for, for entirely different reasons, which was the network, the ARPANET and the Internet, were built very specifically and purposefully with as little control inside the network and maximum flexibility at the edges. So that's an anti-establishment view if you want to look at it like that. The telephone system that AT&T and um, other uh, phone companies around the world were running were the exact opposite, of course. They were 100% control. You couldn't have any addition to the service that was provided unless they chose to do it. They were very, very slow and bureaucratic uh, about making any changes because they didn't need to unless it was 100% guaranteed revenue and so forth. It used to be illegal absolutely illegal to attach your own device to the telephone system and then there were some court um, cases and so even things like an answering machine um, were a big deal whereas today you know you can whip up any kind of thing you want on software or hardware and you know just plug it in and it becomes a device and now we get the internet of things where we get tons and tons of devices that are just going to um, uh, populate everything so the the uh, that anti-authority position, uh, which you were asking about from the point of view of a political thing, was also a, an architectural and technical uh, aspect that was deeply understood. Interesting. Let me ask you one, one final thing, and I should have asked you this earlier when we were on this subject. Was the dot triple X case, when dot triple X was being considered, um, was there an attempt by the U.S. government to influence that decision by ICANN? I believe there was. I, I, um, um, it, was uh, it was, uh, first of all, let me say about Triple X is that it was a very messy uh, thing. I've, I've looked at m several pieces of it. I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the initiation of it, which uh, several years took place. I did find myself in the uncomfortable position of having to cast the deciding vote after we had a adverse ruling from uh, independent review panel, and it was the very first independent review panel activity, <coughs> they ruled against us. They said we had denied triple X and we shouldn't have, and they uh, uh, we still had the legal authority to reject their advice. But I thought it was enormously bad precedent for us to be in the position of rejecting that. Um, Strickling and others thought that the advice from the IRP was. Um, not very solid and wasn't reasoned very well. Um, but um, I, I am told in very strong words that uh, uh, one of the prior assistant secretaries, not Strickling, had uh, tried to convince ICANN not to, uh, not to permit triple X. Uh, so, yeah, that's another case. I mean, a lot of stuff, and I don't, I'm sure I don't know all of it. Uh, where those interactions were just were not all that visible. Which again speaks to the validity of an independent ICANN. You bet. You bet. All right. Dr. Stephen Crocker, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Brad.